imagine taking your generosity to the next level, impacting more lives and leaving a godly legacy for generations to come. Get ideas and strategies to do just that when you listen to these personal stories from high-level kingdom champions. The Kingdom Investor Podcast showcases business leaders who have moved from success to significance, sharing how they use worldly wealth for kingdom impact. Discover how they grew in generosity, impacted more lives, and built godly legacies. You'll find motivation, inspiration, and practical steps to grow as a kingdom investor. Welcome to the Kingdom Investor Podcast. This is your host, Daniel White, and I have David Clinton, my co-host here with me. Hello, everybody. And we are interviewing Case Thorpe. Case, you want to say hello and tell the listeners a little bit about yourself? Hello, everybody. Guys, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. So I am an associate pastor for evangelism at First Presbyterian Church of Orlando. Wonderful wife, Judy. We did 20-year celebration this year. Three children, 18, 16, 11. And um, from the South and love living in Florida. And I lead the collaborative, which is a large part of what we're going to talk about, which is the faith and work ministry here at our church. And it's a lot of fun. Awesome case. David, how are you doing today? Doing well. It's a beautiful day here in the fall in North Idaho. Loving it. it. Seems like summer's lasting a little bit longer than we expected because it took a little longer to get here, at least in our part of the country. I'm, I'm really excited to hear about this faith and work ministry you've got going on. Case, would you mind praying for our listeners and open us up today? Sure thing. Thank you. Father, thank you for technology and the way it helps your people find one another and sharpen one another and expand your kingdom. Lord, thank you for the conviction on our hearts about our resources and our talents and how you call us to direct them towards you and your mission of redemption and restoration in this world. So guide our conversation and may it bless our listeners. In Christ's name, amen. 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 So in case I'd like to, I'd love to dive right in. Tell us about the collaborative, how it came to be and what does it do? Sure. So, oh my goodness, probably eight or so years ago. I went to Redeemer Presbyterian in New York City, home of Tim Killer, which I imagine many of your listeners are familiar with. And I was auditing a course through Fuller Theological Seminary, where I got my doctorate. And in this course, the morning was led by Professor, actually the president of Fuller at the time, Richard Mao, great guy, great writer. And then the afternoons were led by their director of the Center for Faith and Work. And in the morning, we get the theory. In the afternoon, we get the practice. And he would bring in lay people to interview and demonstrate and show what they were doing. Well, fellas, it blew me away. And I came home and said to our senior pastor, we've got to figure out what's going on and do it ourselves. Now, this also came towards the tail end of my time of service here at this church as the mission pastor. I added the evangelism department to it at one point, and now I'm just on the evangelism side. But it was through 12 years of leading in local and global mission, I just saw the genius behind BAM, B-A-M, known as business's mission, mm -hmm. and the way in which just giving folks money huh, is it the best model. And right. so... In our mission program, we doubled down on a particular program called Biblical Entrepreneurship. It's a curriculum. Are y'all familiar with that? No, I'm oh, not. Actually, tell us more. Yeah, it's out of Portland, Oregon, a ministry called Nehemiah Project. And Patrice Sage is the leader of that and wrote this curriculum. And he'd be a fantastic guest for y'all, I'm telling you. He's right. a good friend and a very inspirational man. Well, we found two things. When we taught Biblical Entrepreneurship to our congregation, most of whom are professionals. It just let them on fire for a recommitment to their own work, but also it helped a lot of folks building businesses think through the theology of money. But then there's a level two and a level three where they could really get into forming a business plan, getting experienced leaders to pick it apart and help them put it back together. But then on the global side, we had a very unique and beautiful partnership in Madagascar through a longer story of a coup and a denominational president, sanctuary and all this. He <laughs> said, we need jobs. So when he returned to the country, he pushed down a biblical entrepreneurship to the largest Protestant denomination in Madagascar. So I saw we put a thousand people through this curriculum. There was a credit union that came out of it, created by the graduates of this program, for the graduates of this program. 
can account for about 450 jobs. So just the, it just made sense. It made sense. So then the New York experience, I'm like, okay, we need to amplify this. We developed what is called the collaborative and our vision is for cultural renewal. And our conviction is it's through the well-formed integration of our faith and work that leaders shape institutions best. And those institutions actually shape. I think about the fact that right now I can, I'm sitting in downtown Orlando. Our church is a 3,500 member church on a full city block. And over there is the county administration building, the county mayor. Over there is city hall. There's Dr. Phillips, the big performing arts center. All over there is the banks and the business. I can point to different people I know in different seats who are Christ followers. But I don't know if we're going to be able to do that so easily in 20 years, 40 years. I know that in the 80s and 90s, nobody was sitting around thinking we need to get people into those particular seats. Now, I don't go so far as to think we're job matching or making those things happen. But I know we as the church are missing a good bit of our call if we're not taking those top level C-suite kind of folks and discipling them deeply and well. Yeah. Right. So that's the overall vision for the Okay. And how do you guys do that? That sounds amazing. Well, thank you. It's been a thrill ride for me. So how do we do that? Well, sort of at our widest audience, I guess you would say our widest availability, we do online social media content. We have our own podcast called Nuance. We have a newsletter and other electronic media videos and such that I'd invite anybody to go subscribe to or see more on collaborativeorlando.com. But then kind of that next level, we will do gatherings called six questions. These are luncheons where we bring in a community leader and we sit in the position of inquiry and curiosity. So it's not like you bring in the perfect businesswoman whose testimony is incredible and she's made millions of dollars. <laughs> There's a place for that. But we want to hear from the mayor, a Supreme, Florida Supreme Court justice, developers in town who may or may not be people of faith. But what do you think of the Christian community? How can we be? Most now, we've put those forums on hold, but we won't. Back. We also have short form courses, et cetera. Then a next layer, we do a thing called vocational guilds. And we've written this curriculum in a vocational guild is a small group experience with folks from the same industry. And so a group of lawyers, group of real estate, commercial guys. Uh, we've done a stay-at-home parent one because all vocations matter. We've got one right now going for IT. They go through this six month, I'm sorry, six week experience that dives deep into the theology of work. We awesome. operate mostly with a very poor or shallow theology of work that's more shaped by culture. Yeah. So it really has been fruitful. In fact, we are going to stretch into another arena. We had a local community come in conversation and come to us and say, hey, could we use that for our own executives and team building? Absolutely. Yeah. And so they had a tremendous experience and they're wanting to do more. Finally, our tightest and deepest wells are fellowships. I am convinced Sunday school, small groups only do so much yeah, and they're not going to be able to do enough in discipleship for the future that the church holds in America. So what's a fellowship? It is a long, intense experience that is based in community and it pairs, all of our programs pair spiritual formation with the intellectual exercise. That to me was one of the geniuses that Keller and Redeemer show is I could pour a lot of information up here in my head, look, but I've got all these holes in my head. <laughs> two nostrils, two ears, and mouth. I mean, it's going to leak, right? Over time. But if you form and shape the heart, like that good Georgia red clay that I grew up with, I mean, it is hard to get unformed and it lasts for decades. Dude. So we have three kinds of fellowships. The first one we call Orlando Heart of the City Fellows. It is a 10-month experience for a recent college graduate. They live in one of our fa church family's homes. We help them find a local job Monday through Wednesday. We try to get it in their field of interest. I teach them a faith and work course on Thursdays and a biblical narrative course. They also have small group time and a local leader. And then the year is filled with mission trip, retreats, great experiences. So it's a year of integrating faith and work deeply before they either launch or go on to graduates. Wow. It's affiliated with the TFI, the Fellowships, the Fellows Initiative, which is a national ministry with about 27 chapters. And the statistics are true. 70% of your fellows end up staying in your community, if not actually your church. And what's beautiful is we could probably find 150 people in our church who've touched the program in some way as a host home, a job giver, et cetera. And so I, as a pastor, I'll tell other pastors, you want a golden bullet to jumpstart your church? Look at the fellows. Second, we have Orlando, I'm sorry, we have the Gotham Fellowship. And you may be familiar, it is a program directly out of Redeemer. We license it from them. 
It's a nine month graduate graduate level type intensity for Christ Center professionals, age 25 to 70. And then we have a new thing we just started this year. We're about to start our second one called the Arts Fellows Arts Fellowship Orlando. And there we take five artists who are experienced. These are people who like to do hobby art, but experienced Christian artists through a six-month discipleship program, they get a $5,000 grant to create a project of some sort, maybe advance a project they've had sitting on the shelf. And then in June, we rent the big downtown theater. And last year we had 300 people come out and they perform or present their projects and talk about their work of art and integration. So that's a lot, yeah. Uh, but we're trying to be intentional with a variety of avenues and with a focused theology and message. That's amazing to me. It sounds to me like the core of all this it, from a stewardship perspective would be about steward, stewarding the influence that God's given you. Is that right? Sure. Well, and I have to be careful when I say this because I, I, there is not an intent to be exclusive or aristocratic, but I mean, it, it is an approach to the 5%, top 2%. And absolutely, you got to get your local mission and global mission work in place. But that's often th when we've got a homeless ministry. We work with a foster care ministry. I mean, you cannot forget the vulnerable, and, but most mission works from the bottom up in society, especially when you get in the global context. But you know, we've also got to be focused on the top 2% because if you think how much influence the men and women in Hollywood on Madison Avenue and Wall Street have on our daily lives. Right. And if they lose the Christian story, if the Christian values that may rattle around in some degree of our culture anymore, I mean, we've got to have sharp, well-trained disciples in those places. Yeah, absolutely. I'm curious about your background and how did God prepare you years earlier on to get to where you are today? Well, I was very blessed to grow up in a Christian home. We were cultural Christians, though. It was later through great influence of our youth and children's director that my parents came to faith and I did as well. But also my dad is a pretty impressive guy. He had three very successful careers in three very different ways. He served in the military in Vietnam, but then was getting, he got his master's and then getting his doctorate in the direction of television journalism, had a look TV show and was working for the extension service with farmers and helping in the communications. Well, but then his father, who was a Southern Bell executive, now Bell South, was retiring and had a couple of Dairy Queens on the side. So my dad said, let me buy one. <laughs> so from there, he went on to open the second Dairy Queen in a mall in the U.S. and numerous more laundromats, rental properties. I mean, it was the 80s yuppie small businessman thing. And he did very well financially. And then he hit a wall in his early 40s and had a spiritual renewal, recognizing, you know, it's not about the money. And I need to be the husband God wants me to be. I need to be the father of God. So he sold all the businesses, kept the properties and said, I want a nine to five job. And he went into business with a buddy doing petroleum financing and that to the end of his career. So I had a model who was in a variety of different work type roles, but also one who had a dramatic turning point in his faith and work integration. Wow. And you know, honestly, guys, I don't know that I really put that together until I just answered you. <laughs> That's must have been really neat to see your father go through that. You, you were there, right? Watching him just switch his direction. And I remember the summer he was in this transition and he very beautifully thought, I'm going to catch up on a number of years of not being so present. Right. And we went to several rapes, games in Atlanta and the science museum for kids. And we'd go play tennis and do stuff. And I mean, prior to that, he was involved and no doubt ever of his love for us. But he had that, I guess, pushed by God that there's more things than just the material and rechannel. Case, do you think there was a particular catalyst to that? There was. I don't know if you or your listeners may be familiar, but the walk to Emmaus is, it was, and it's still around, but it was a very popular retreat for lay people. Mm -hmm. Again, at the Catholic Church in the Spain of the 40s. And it is a very intense weekend where the love of Christ is presented in some very unique, and powerful ways. Some talks are given that mix some good, solid theology and testimony. And I call it an experience to kind of wake up people. Interesting. It's not so designed for the non-believer to meet Christ, although that happens. But it's really for that kind of average churchgoer to recognize, wow, this is what a life of discipleship looks like. Wow, that's neat. I wonder, what are some of the things that you've learned along the way in this journey 
that you maybe you didn't expect to learn. It is so incredibly difficult to recruit for a number of our programs. And I'll be honest, like, I mean, the six months leading up to Gotham Fellowship, if I want to find 10 to 12 people, because it's that unique, very unique person that wants to read 100 pages a week. Yeah. <laughs> wants to get up every Wednesday morning for, from 6.30 to 8.30. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's hard. And I say, we're not tiptoeing through the tulips. So the recruitment for that is intense and a lot. Um, our vocational guild, the recruitment is intense. It takes a lot of work. I think I assume there was more of a hunger for faith work integration. and realizing as a pastor, boy, I've got a lot of plans for your life, right? How, do, I mean, our whole church has embraced faith and work. And they hear it in the sermons, they hear it in worship, but still that's been difficult to do. Yep. And then convincing someone that the spiritual formation side is even more important than the intellectual side. Mm -hmm. I'm a nerd and I'm known to be the teacher. And I think a lot of people then think, oh, well, collaborative stuff, just more books and nerdiness. <laughs> and I try to convey, look, there's a lot of intense theology, but it's every program is 51% prayer. It's learning these spiritual formation tools that get you through and get you the rich life in Christ you probably thought you were signing up. Yeah, yeah, that recruitment is hard. I resonate with that. I run Journeys of Generosity as often as the calendar allows a faith-driven entrepreneur yeah. group. And you got to send out a hundred invites to get 10 people even to respond. And I, I, love, I cover these things in a lot of prayer. Like, you know what? God brings who he wants to be there. And the last jog I did, one person showed up, even though like eight RSVP. And it was still a great time. He still wanted to go through all the material and like, okay, I, that's what God had for us today. Well, and it's, every person that does go through it, they're like, oh my goodness, I right. can't believe. And you're just like, how do we bottle that and share that with the next person? <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. So I wanted to ask a question about like, how do you get involvement from different pers participants in the church and involved in these different ministries and everything? What does that look like? Well, I guess it goes back to my statement. How do you bottle this? To me, it's the peer to peer test because sadly, executives, professionals will often look at pastors and some don't have much respect. I get that. Or some do have a respect and understanding, but the skill set is so very different. The environment is so very different. So I have found when you look at another banker, you look at another hospitality manager, like you will listen. Number two, though, I'm already a curious person. I take the Wall Street Journal, New York Times. I have found when with someone, whether it's over a meal or not, I mean, I'm just curious about their job and I dig and I often encourage other pastors. You need to know some basics on business and some basics in the marketplace. And so I'm always trying to find out, okay, how does that work? And where's the profit and how do you manage people? And so it helps, I think, to speak others' language. So, what is, so Billy Graham said that the next great revival will happen in the marketplace. What do you think about that? I agree, but I don't agree because I'm a champion and I lead these kind of ministries and I want people to be in, right? Yeah. I agree because when the faith and work movement, well, let me back up. So marketplace ministries are important, very important, but I wouldn't describe what we're doing the collaborative as a marketplace ministry. In fact, we here at First Press historically have three unbelievable marketplace ministries, one of which has gone national. So, so I, what are those? Just for our listeners, can you define yeah. that a little bit and maybe give some examples of marketplace ministries? For sure. So the gathering of men, wonderful gathering place, Thursday lunch to hear an inspirational speaker and then break off into small groups from there. And it's a great place you can bring co worker. So that has chapters all over the country. A second woman that has grown all over the country is called Life Work Leadership. Mm -hmm. And two elders in our church, one of whom is a work colleague with my wife, began sort of like a leadership. Uh, I know that a lot of cities will do leadership Raleigh or leadership Orlando, leadership New York. It's the same kind of thing, but with a Christian worldview and perspective on it. They meet once a month for a full day over the course of eight, nine months and get great inspiration and training. And then there's a third ministry that's local here, done by one of our elders called J4. And it's a woman who is a top executive in one of the bigger companies here, actually the only Fortune 100 or 200, I think, that is, comes from Orlando. And she had a heart for executive women who are Christ followers. And so she gets that from Judges 4, and that's great. So I come along with Clem. I don't want to make competition, and I want to build allies. And we've, I feel, really been able to do that, and they would agree. And this is why. Marketplace ministry is needed. Historically, it has focused on evangelism and ethics needed. We need to be witnessing to our coworkers, and we need to be following a moral path that represents Christ. I feel like, though, the faith and work movement that Keller's absolutely gotten going, Tom Nelson made flourish, 
very close with them, was actually made to flourish co-leader here in Orlando for a number of years. And this movement, it truly is a movement. And so at the time I was asked, is this just another fad ministry? Come on, Kate, we did Purpose Driven Life and look how that ran its course. And oh, we had emergent worship and look how that ran its course. Yeah. And at first I thought, yikes, maybe it is, sure. but I, I don't think so now. And this is why you see the faith and work movement happening at so many different levels and in so many different institutions. It's in churches. It's in the nonprofit expression, like the Denver Faith and Work, our friends over there. It's in seminaries and colleges, like the Depew Center for Leadership at Fuller Center. There's think tanks that will put full staff or money in this direction. Foundations investing. Publishing houses getting into this. Right now, media. I mean, you don't, fads don't run the gamut of those major institutions. Mm. And because it is, I think it screams. There's a there's a gap. Right. And we better hurry and fill it before the church gets too weak and small in the American context. And not just out of a, oh, this guy's falling with that chicken little perspective, <laughs> but it works. And it's where people spend most of their time. Yeah. And I think there's a huge hunger for it. A lot of demand, so to speak, in the church and Christians' hearts, realizing there's a disconnect here. I, you know, I live my religion on Sunday and get back to work on Monday. And we've but, missed it over the last decade. Well, see, but that's where I struggle because like I said earlier, as a pastor, I've assumed so many people would jump on this. So I think it's like sometimes you have to convince somebody they're simple before they can understand the gospel. Sure. I think the darkness is so real. The disconnect is so wide for your good Christians, solid churchgoers, that even convincing them that there's a third way here. Right. And once that happens, they're off and running. So it's an so educational it's struggle. It's an uphill battle and even making people see the need. Well, and so like we have about 70 Gotham alumni now in Orlando. We're about 45-ish Orlando fellows. They're off and running and they're leading our vocational guilt and they're soaking up our content and because they've been convinced. Right. Interesting. I, do you, have you got any interest in expanding to other cities or do you, you have a real heart for your city? And like, I'm at my capacity. I'm not interested in that. Yeah. I mean, if the Lord made that happen, I do think we've got something to share. But no, I mean, our focus is solely here. Very grateful for the greater faith and work community. And it's strong. I am regularly in touch with counterparts and peers all over the country and these things. And that's good. In fact, foundations and think tanks and stuff will put money into bringing us together and helping us get nurtured as well. But yeah, I mean, our church is a 146-year-old church in downtown Orlando, and we love this place. We love this city, and we want to see our city better and stronger. Yeah. Well, as I wonder if other people, listeners, for example, hear this and get excited about it, is there a way that you can share what you've learned so they can go start something similar in their city? Sure. So, you know, email me. Let's talk. I get a lot of phone calls. CollaborativeOrlando.com is our site. And we've, we just did a refresh in designing it. And there's lots of great content on there, but also links and referrals to other organizations around the country. Cool. Made to Flourish has a wide reach geographically. They're shifting a bit with their city network approach, but there may be a city near you where at least there's a concentrated group of folks in that regard. But yeah, I mean, email me. Casethorpe at gmail.com, Casethorpe at gmail.com, no E on the end. Would love to help. And cool. yeah. Do you guys collaborate with Faith Driven Entrepreneur as well? It seems like right in the same lane as them. We, so this was kind of fun. An entrepreneur from my congregation came to me and said, hey, I have a passion for that ministry and their satellite program, right? And so we partnered and lifted it up and got a crowd together to watch and their content's fantastic. Mm. That's neat. Yeah. So Case, you know, we learn a lot from our success, but also we learn a lot from failure. Is there a failure in this journey or maybe one that you've learned a lot from and you'd like to share? Sure. Well, so for instance, like I mentioned, the six question luncheons, which were so successful and we put them on pause and there's a reason for that, but there was a lesson in that I've learned for the next time we do them. And this is, and let me say, this reason and this lesson are in the face of unbelievable fruit. Right. I mean, they were well attended, great buzz, great content, some of which is on the website. So for whatever that's worth, the failure was there wasn't yet at that time full institutional buy-in for the work of the collaborative. And so it stressed out other departments. That and and there was a willingness there to partner and help make these things happen. But there wasn't the built-in capacity in like facilities and communications and all the other places that it hit. Well, 
that very reason right there, though, led to this other dynamic was we as a church five years ago or so hit the pause button on everything. We wiped the slate clean because let me tell you, First Pres Orlando, it was, but hopefully is changing the epitome of the attraction church. Come here, come to our bookstore, come to our rent ministry, come to, you know, it's all about coming. So our leadership team, we got hardcore consultants, our whole session, and we have been moving in the missional direction explicitly. Mm -hmm. And what I love is I've done a lot of consulting work myself, but also with others. And a lot of times they leave the reports on the table and well, it worked this time. And so my point in that is there's much greater agreement now of where our energy is going to go, what's most strategic. I'm grateful that a whole lot of the things the Collaborative Institute introduced in the way of missional thinking and missional organization and activity helped to shape a lot of this conversation. So looking back though, I think the failure was I wasn't sensitive enough to capacity and I hadn't done the groundwork yet to get others going in the right direction. It seems like an interesting tension to, uh, you know, what do you build first when things kind of need to grow together, right? Capacity. Yeah, and that's right. And you, look, that's and, not, you need faith and work, Clark, right? Like any organization struggles with that. I think the other feeling of failure right now for us is on this assumption that vocational guilds would be hugely popular and engaged. Mm. And those that do it, my goodness, they're on board. Like this company, this bank is asking for round two, but convincing people's hard, hard. Yeah. That's interesting. I wonder if there's a common reason, you know, people like I'm just too busy or they believe they're too busy or they're like resistant to the potential growth that they know growth is hard. I, you know, I, I don't know. I just wonder what, what some of the common strings are for why people are unresponsive when we invite them to things like this. Yeah. Busyness. Absolutely. However, you do what you want to do. <laughs> That's right. right. I mean, oh, I'm too busy, but I really need a tan. So I'll go to the tanning. So I don't buy that one so much. It's as we've said, people don't really see the need. Right. I would also add when we were creating the collaborative, especially when we got with our communications department and narrowed in on our brand. So if you go to the website, you'll see it's a very neutral brand intentionally. We didn't want to just scream Christianese and not allow for a bigger conversation. But at that time, the director of communications said something brilliant. And she said, Case, you need to keep in mind, this is an entirely new and different thing. And people don't have a category already in their head. <laughs> right. She said, you know, when Diet Coke comes out with lime Diet Coke, you're like, yeah, Diet Coke with lime. <laughs> You've got a category. Missional ministry is so unique, and but a unicorn right now. Be patient. Let things grow slow. Pour meaning into your brand that is different and give people time to get their mind around difference. Yeah, that's really encouraging. I've really been encouraged by your experience in this because I'm trying to do similar stuff in my area with faith and work and generosity and stewardship and things like this. And there's so little responsiveness from people that I know and love. And, yeah. and it's so confusing to me. Like, why wouldn't my best friend show up to this thing I'm doing, right? <laughs> so it's, that's very helpful. Well, and not to throw your best friend under the bus. <laughs> so I do not know. But I also think this is a higher level discipleship ask and experience. Right. Maybe somebody, you, know, you gotta get the biblical narrative down first. Yeah. Or maybe you need to have some degree of a prayer life. Am I expecting and asking people to go do the long jump in the Olympics before they've ever even done it in high school? So keep at it for sure. Don't pull back. But also, I think maybe I've had to reset expectations. Yeah, sure. Let me, one more encouragement though, I hope. So you said you did a jog and had one person come, right? Yeah. So my senior pastor grew up in Dallas in the Roman Catholic Church, but at the Presbyterian Church, the boys played basketball. And in high school, he went every time and played. Well, there was an associate pastor at that Presbyterian Church who invited all the guys to come to a morning Bible study. My senior pastor was the only one that showed up. Pastor said, one's enough for me. They sat there for nine months and learned the whole Bible. Wow. <laughs> and now look at where he is today, preaching to thousands. Yeah. So if your financial model allows you to just focus on a few, it's okay. That's right. We just need to be faithful, right? This is what God gave me today. Okay, I'm going to start as well. Fairly successful. Yeah. 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 So g going back a little bit to, you know, talking to somebody that, you know, might be sitting on the sidelines or, or hasn't gotten the opportunity to experience what a deeper discipleship or deeper intensive group like this yields, maybe speaking to them for a minute, because I was, I, my wife and I were thinking about this uh, in the car the other day and we were just thinking about, would we have grown spiritually like we did over the last five or six years if we had not been pursued by mentors and people that discipled us 
and they initiated. And then we kind of started to grow and then we got hungry. And then we were like, okay, we want some more of this growth. But I think we wouldn't have probably sought them out initially. And so I think it did take some of them to initiate the relationships. And then once we started getting discipled and started to see the growth You know, and it's not immediate, uh, but over time, you know, the Lord working through people that are discipling or mentoring you, you really see uh, some of the growth. So maybe speaking to somebody who hasn't gotten to experience that yet, what would you say to them? Yeah. Well, mentoring always works up. Mentoring always works up. Churches try to do these mentoring programs. I've not known one that succeed because it's too artificial. And it's, you hear, especially if you're a denominational church that's trying to shift to be more effective. You always hear, oh, well, we've got all these great older folks who have all this wisdom and all the young folks don't know anything anymore. And why don't we get all our young folks, our old folks, reach out to them? I've never known one to work, but mentoring works up. Meaning if you're that 32 year old guy growing in marketing, go find the godly individual who knows that world or at least business in general and pursue them. And I find, you know, if somebody's not willing to mentor or wanting to, they'll make it clear and they'll bail out and not be available. But but if always works best going up. Mm -hmm. So I have a mentor and he's amazing. I mean, I have several, but one particular, and it's my duty to keep in touch with him. It's my responsibility to let him know I need to talk or I appreciate your wisdom. He will check in and we see each other socially, but I just think work up. Interesting. So to to try to spur something on like that in a church culture, for instance, it seems like the, the younger people need to see the need. Once again, it's it's before they're going to start seeking out mentors. People who think they've got it all together don't yeah. look for mentors, right? But you got to tell the story. So get it in testimonies. Get a mentor and younger person up on up front to share about the experience. Yeah. Tell that story in your communications. Work it into pastor's illustrations. Yeah, that's good. Sense. Before we enter the mentor minute, speaking of mentors, would you, is there anything else that you want to share with our audience that would be helpful to them? Well, I think kind of time we've been talking, if you're on the edge or curious, look, jump into whatever faith and work opportunity is around you because it speaks so very deeply to the core of who we are as Americans. My goodness, how hard we work and how much our jobs become part of our identity. If you are one who has a mature discipleship walk, still st- get involved because, so my particular mentor, when he did biblical entrepreneurship, he said to me, you know what, Case, I've done all of this kind of stuff for 35 years in home building, and I believe didn't knew it, but I never had it laid out for me systematically. Mm-hmm. He said, I never figured out a way to convey or pass this along to my own son, my own company, or those I'm entering, but now... I've got a tool. And then finally, if you are in a position of leadership, whether you own your company, whether you are a hiring manager of sorts, I'm not expecting or asking for you to make your workplace a church. But I do think there are ways you can express your worldview from where you come, your reflections, the reasons why you do what you do. And that witness is so very much needed. There are ways to talk about Christian values in secular terms, but also let it be explicitly known that I'm not here to punch out widgets. I'm here to glorify the Lord. I'm here to provide for my family, which glorifies the Lord. I'm here to all these godly reasons rather than just widgets. Yeah, that's good. Awesome. All right, Case, who is the most influential person that you know and how have they impacted you? Oh my goodness. <laughs> the most. That's a, I mean, how about one? Just one. Ah, <laughs> uh, well. <laughs> Y'all didn't warn me on this one. Yeah. I didn't warn me on this one. One of the most, maybe. Yeah. I got to do one of the most. Now, one of the most is a professor I had at an undergraduate at a university named Bobby Patterson. And Bobby taught in the religion department, and she held very different political views than myself, very different theological views for sure. And yet, to me, she had such a hospitable, welcoming spirit and did not condemn or judge me for being an evangelical or whatever she thought of my politics. And it just made me realize how important hospitality and generosity all are and th- to embrace the other. I've got her picture right here on my desk from my day of ordination. And I've tried to model that in my ministry. That actually is a big part of our, our podcast called Nuance, where we're just asking our brothers and sisters to slow down a little bit in this cultural moment. And 
what does your hospitality and generosity look like and how does it help your witness or not? Yeah, that's really neat. All right. And then what book or podcast has changed the course of your life? No pressure. It changed the course of my life. Yeah. Well, Lost Horizon is my favorite novel. It's by James Hilton and it's written in the 50s after World War II. And it's where we get the idea of Shangri-La from. And they are a group of random people together on a plane that goes down in the Himalayas and they discover this hidden city and it's run by Buddhist monks and yet there is a Christian stream through it. it. And that book is great. I mean, to me, not just because of any theological reason, but the long conversations on the meaning and search for life, the adventure, Lost Horizon, I try my best to read it at least once a year. Wow. wow. Good. Cool. All right. And then what's the greatest lesson that you've learned about leadership? Be real with everybody, whether they're way down in the organization or above you, just authenticity. Don't be, yeah, I've learned these lessons. Don't be real in your negative, hungry, hangry kind of moments, right? <laughs> but just try to be authentic and love and respect and dignify each person. That's good. Case, how can we be praying for you or your family? Thank you. Ooh, my wife started a new business. And so I had so much fun to see your wife grow and it's doing very, very well. And so I just pray for her. Also, her father's ill and it's not good. So just for the way we have a daughter going to college. So, you know, the Thorpe family has got a lot of transition and stress right now. Yeah, That'd be great. All right. Well, let me pray real quick and then we'll close out the show. All right. God, I thank you and praise you for this time. I thank you for all the listeners. And I thank you for the wisdom that Case has shared with us today. I pray for his family and all the transitions they're going through. And I pray that you would bless their ministry and life. Lord, you are so good to us. You are guiding us every day. And we thank you and praise you for that. In Christ's name, I pray. All right. Thanks, fellas. I really enjoyed this. Yeah, it was great talking to you today. For our listeners, again, if you want to email Case Thorpe, no E, at gmail.com. And then the uh, the collaborative website again? CollaborativeOrlando.com. Okay. And we're on all the social media platforms. All right. And check out the Nuance podcast. Please. And you can see a video version like we're doing here on our YouTube channel. Excellent. Thank you so much for your time today, Case. Have a wonderful day. Bye.